Jesus describes himself as many things, but one thing we are made to understand, and, and probably one of my most favorite um, illustrations, it's really more than an illustration, but a symbolism that you, uh, Jesus does as he describes himself, is he is the bread of life. Why do I like this? Well, first of all, I'm Filipino. Number two, I love, I love food. And when you, when you are hungry, I want you to think the last time you were hungry. Maybe you're hungry now and you cannot wait to get in there. By the way, I'm glad Brian is here because Jeff made a taco bar for you. And so just for you. By the way, this is also Jeff's last, last, um, last Sunday here. And so before I go on with my sermon, I just caught myself. I'm, uh, I asked my sister to give a special number to the Lord. And so sister, please come and praise him. Uh, most of you know about my husband. Um, Nauras right now is in Syria together with his brothers and, and the other 35 other people who live in Abu Dhabi and UAE. And they are protecting their town and their homes from ISIS and the Syrian Free Army or the Syrian rebels. Um, in, the, in less than two months, he's been shot three times. He lost a couple of his uncles, some of his cousins, many of his friends, and not a day goes by that I didn't ask God why this is all happening when everything is going well from his application for the, um, the immigrant visa, the um, interview that we've been waiting for, everything is right. We even, you know, the guy interviewing him in, from San Francisco has been asking for him every week. So there's a job, there's a home, there's money. Like, everything is right. Why is this happening? Um, I've been very upset, and I ask God daily why this is happening. And I realize that I would never know why. <laughs> Not right now. And I just continue praying. I, I have to continue praying. And I have given up on the, the bigger things and the bigger requests and just focus on his protection. And every, I'm always attached to my phone because I always get, I would get a text from him and I go, oh, he's alive. And I thank God for that. And then the next day, I pray again for that day, for protection for that day. And when Nauras told me that he was going to be leaving to go to Syria, I played this song over and over again. And I keep on focusing on the words that said, I don't see the good in all this. And it's been five months, and I still don't see the good in all of it. Uh, but I, I've been trying my best, and I, I fail some days, to focus on the other words that says, I rest in your knowing, though I may not know. Um, and I know that some of you, a lot of you have been praying for something, and there's just no answer. Uh, there's no explanation why things are going on that way. And um, here's hoping that we just keep on praying every day. Um, um, you may not know, but he is in control. That's hard when things are not going right, but he is in control.
reply My questioning still lingers though Of, of, uh, that the Lord gave us today. I want you to go to John chapter 6, verse 35. And, and the song talks about needing something, needing something from Him, either a direction or a, um, a, um, a sign or an answer to our prayer. And one of the things that I've said uh, before when, uh, when I started this is that we are made to understand that he is the bread of life because it satisfies something. When you read John chapter 6, verse 35, this is what it says. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and, who, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. You see, you see the need, hunger, and thirst, and Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. When you come to me, I will satisfy that. John chapter 6, verses 48 to 51, he says it again. I am the bread of life, as if we didn't hear it the first time. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, heaven which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread, verse 51 that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Again, you see that he, he, uh, he parallels himself with the manna that was given in the desert. And for those of us who don't know the story of the Israelites or the Hebrews during that time, they were, after they were um, um, let go from Egypt, they now come to the desert, and so for 40 years, they're walking around, and so in the beginning, they did not have any food. And so uh, uh, Jesus is saying, you know, that story happened. The manna that they ate, uh, have, 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 uh, in a way, did not allow them to live forever, but here's a different bread. 
that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. He goes, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. This must be the text that God wants us to hear this morning. Because I know that it's not only Jack, it's not only probably myself, but we have a room full of people here who are wondering. Maybe not wondering where your husband is because your husband is here. Maybe you're not wondering where your spouse is because your spouse is here. Maybe you're wondering when your spouse is going to come to you. But many of us are wondering about our future. Many of us are wondering about where we are going. Um, where is God's guidance? Where is God's leading? One of the things that, uh, that has, has, has um, taken place in my life, as you know, in the past probably five years, is that there's never a teaching position that is um, solid or stable. And when I came to work for the state, many of the teachers were saying, ah, you did the right thing. I don't know why you just came now, they said. You know, you should have gotten out of the public school system and you should have gone into correctional education from the very beginning because over here, it's stable. You will never lose your job. And so in, in the back of my head, I'm going, that's wonderful. I'm always losing my job in the adult education, in, in the school district. And so over here, they said, you will never lose your job. That was September of last year. Last month, we started, uh, we started talking about, uh, remember uh, I was talking about Prop 57 and how there's so much need in correctional education for teachers to come and teach over there. Uh, I've been telling Jeff, I've been telling Neris, if you guys want to uh, go teach inside <laughs> the prisons, you know, there is a job for you. But one of them said, uh, one of the news that came to us uh, two weeks ago is that this will not be forever. And I'm sitting there, I'm going, again? Again, Lord? I thought it's going to be stable. I thought it's going to be here for a while. And so to, to, to look for God's guidance, to look for God's provision, where is God's leading for all of you? Where is God's leading for me? Where is God's leading you, God, God's guidance in your life as you think about whatever it is that you're asking the Lord to do? Will he continue to provide? In the text, he references the Israelites' journey through the desert. And he seems to be saying that bread in the Old Testament is the same bread today. But the bread has transformed itself dramatically today, he said. He didn't bring them this far to let them starve. He has a plan for them just as he does for us. And all we must do is follow. And, whatever, and, whatever, and whether the path lead us over the mountain or a valley, or even through a sea, a desert, a wilderness, whatever, or truly maybe from last week's message, through the valley of the shadow of death. He promises to meet the needs along the way if only we'll follow. But the Israelites, as we know, did not believe that. And again, return to their complaining. You guys know a lot of people who complain? Are you sitting beside a person who does that all the time? And when does the complaining start? Complain, complain, complain. Complain that you don't have a better job. Complain that your job may not last. That's my complaint. What else? Complain uh, that um, your, 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 your spouse is this. Complain that your husband doesn't change. Complain that your wife talks too much. Complain that you're not meeting all your needs. Complain that this church is not growing numerically fast enough for you. Complain that this is going on and, or this is not going on. Complain that the pastor is not doing this when she should be doing this. Complain that the praise team is this. Complain that the, uh, the board is this. Complain that whatever it is that you want to complain about. Whatever it is that I want to complain about. There's always some complain in our life, complaining in our lives. And just like us, the Israelites would wake up every morning and they were promised manna from heaven, bread from heaven. And sure enough, Every time they wake up, there is food there. There is food for them. You, you think they would stop complaining. Ano nga kayo? Gumising kayo isang araw, binuksan nyo yung pinto ng bahay nyo, tapos may pagkain dun sa labas. Hindi nyo kailangan lutuin. Hindi nyo kailangan pag-ipagtrabaho. It's going to be there. 
Imagine that. Then I ask you this question. When you open the doors of your homes and then you look out and there's food there every day, would you still complain? What is the answer? Probably. If you open your doors every day and then you see food there for you or bread there for you, would you complain? What would be your complaint? Not enough. What else? It's cold. Someone going to heat it up for me? What else? Huh? Ito na naman. Tinapay na naman. What else? Or, Pilipino ako, gusto ko? Kanin. Hindi tinapay. There's always going to be a complaint every day. And that is exactly what the Israelites, I'm sorry, the Hebrews were doing. They're not a nation yet. So the Hebrews were doing, they would wake up each morning, find manna on the ground, and even in the midst of their complaining, by the way, because they still complain, God provided, continued to provide for them, just like it says in Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply what? All your needs. Of course, the, the Hebrews, I'm not, I'm not uh, telling you that the Hebrews should have known that, but you know, if you fast forward and you become the Hebrew and you open your door every day and there's bread there, and even though we already know what Philippians 4.19 says, but my God shall supply what? Shall supply all your needs according to whose riches? Your riches? According to the United States riches? No, according to his riches in glory by Jesus Christ. Not all our greeds, but all our needs. Not all our greeds, but all our needs. Did manna get old? And as Evelyn said a while ago, ito na naman, manna again perhaps in terms of variety, but it always met their needs. I remember, and I've told you this story before, but my high school cafeteria in Iowa, we would have the usual stuff, and by the way, we have tacos all the time. I have, I have no idea why. And that's probably why I did not like tacos growing up, or at least the, the year I spent there. But we would have the usual stuff all the time. But every day, we have this thing on the side, just in case you don't like, the food that is being uh, cooked that day by the cafeteria. On the side, there will always be something called taverns. And, and, and in Iowa, we also, uh, in, in Iowa, we call it taverns. But in the, um, in the whole wide world, in the Midwest, they actually call it loose meat sandwiches. And it, it, you, guys, you, you guys have, uh, you, we now have Food Network, we now have the Travel Channel, and they always talk about loose meat sandwiches in the Midwest. Midwest. And, and exactly what it is is this. It's just ground beef, there's no seasoning, there's no tomatoes, there's no, it's just uh, ground meat with onions, and then it's loose, right? It's not formed into burgers, and then they steam it, and then they steam the bread, and then they put the loose meat in there, and then you eat it. And some of you may look, oh, with pickles, by the way, you gotta, you gotta have pickles. And some of you might look at me and going, that is not good. But every single day, just in case, you don't like the food there, you can always go and get taverns. Yet, every single day, all of my classmates will complain. Complain about the food that was given to them by the cafeteria and complain about the taverns that's there. You know, why can't we have something else there all the time? Why can't we have something other than tacos all the time? Because it's there every day, and in case there's nothing else you can eat, I'm the only one who eats it that I know of. And, and to them, they have it every day, so everyone still complains every day. No fail. But it's our nature to complain, especially when we get into the habit of this. You know, and like the guy who would say, just like you guys, you open the door, you've got bread there, and yet you're still going to complain because no one heated it for you. So why did Jesus say, I am the bread of life? He's not just talking about opening the doors of your of your homes and then finding that there's bread there. He said, I'm the bread of life. First, Jesus is like, he's saying, I'm like the manna in, uh, uh, in the Old Testament or dur uh, during your forefathers' time because it describes who he is. Manna is small and it talks about the humble coming of Jesus. It speaks about his humility. You're not going to see nice potato bread. Manna is not very good. It's just a dry bread. And there's so many descriptions of manna that some of them think that manna is not even that. It's, 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 it's this little pellets. Pellets, can you imagine? Of course you're going to be complaining. What are these things? They're not even big. They're not even nice and, and juicy and whatever it is that you want to get, uh, what you want your, your bread to be. But that's exactly what manna is. It's small. 
And maybe it speaks about the coming of Jesus, his humble coming. It speaks about his humility. He came as a small baby in a manger. That's an act of humility. He left heaven for this. Not even for a palace, but a stable. What was his first scene to look on? The first sounds that he hears. The first smell that he, he smelled. His humility continued throughout his adult ministry. He washed the disciples' feet and consorted with the poor and the deceased. Manna was white and there's purity in it. It is round and it has no end. And it was sweet bread. You know, and I know what that means. That's just good bread. And you know, sometimes you look at it and you go, you Pastor Jay, you're putting too much symbolism into that. But I want you to think about that. Why manna? Why did he mention manna from the desert? And not just the way manna looks, but secondly, the way manna came is the same way Jesus did. The bread wasn't brought from Egypt. They did not manufacture it in Egypt and brought it along with them. Or maybe they manufactured it in the wilderness along the way. It came from heaven. There's no manufacturing of manna. It's something that appeared in their doorstep. Manna fell as a gift, not as something that they made, not that they something that they raised, but something that was a gift from heaven right where the people were, meaning they did not have to go somewhere else to get it. All you have to do is open the doors of your homes and you will get manna. Manna came from heaven and he comes directly to where we are. Manna comes right where and when the people needed it, which is right outside their door. John 6.33 says, For the bread of life is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. The manna also came at night. And you might say, no, what, what, is the, what is the distinction there, Pastor Jay? Jesus coming to us while we are in the dark and even in our sin and even in the midst of complaining. Think about it. When, 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 when God gave them manna from heaven on the first day, and they started to complain. If I were God, I would go, no more manna for you. No more manna for you the next day. No more food for you the next day. complain ka rin pala. Never mind, I'm not going to give it to you. And yet, even in the midst of complaining, even in the midst of sin, even in the midst of telling God we should have just gone back to Egypt, you know, it's better there, at least we can eat something. Even in the midst of that, Every day, manna came right where they needed it and just when they needed it. Dr. Robert Sumner tells of an unusual grave in West Texas. Grave, someone where someone was buried in. Uh, and it's still there today. It has a little window. So if you look at a grave, you know the graves that we have here are on the ground? This one has a little window. And you might go, oh, that's creepy. But there's actually a little window there. You really cannot see all the way down, six feet under. But there's a purpose for that window. And so there's a little window where you can see, you have your, uh, I guess you have a powerful, um, um, what is this called? Flashlight, you can do that. But there's a little window where you can see all the way down to the casket, six feet under. And sunlight makes, it way, makes its way all the way down there um, every day. And it's the grave of a little 10-year-old boy who on his deathbed said to his dad, Daddy, when I die, don't leave me in the dark. Promise me you won't leave me in the dark. And that little boy knew there was no assurance, so he asked for the light. And this, that's the, the way, the only way that the dad can, can kind of say, yes, I will not leave you in the dark. In our world today, we are moving in darkness. We are always in the midst of complaining. We are always in the midst of looking at the, uh, at the blessings of God, looking at the promises of God that He has given to us, and we go, Kulang! We look at the blessings of the Lord and go, there's something wrong with this, Lord. You know, you almost got it right. But if we can just tweak it a little bit, that'll be great. You know, I got this job. It'd be nice if it's closer. Oh, I, I got this job. It'd be nice if I don't have to wear a uniform. Or vice versa. Oh, you know, I now I, 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 got the, I, I, I finished school and, I, and I, I now I get a job. But it would be nice if it's a, a better job, a higher paying job. Or some of you might even say, Lord, thank you for my husband, but can I get a better one? Or can you fix this one? So that will be better. In our world today, we are moving in darkness. We are moving in complaints. We're moving 
in, 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 in situations where we want more, when we want things better, when we want to, things to change. You know, when the stock market loses its biggest value in one day, and, and the average price of a house fell 23% or, or 25%, you start looking at you and going, why did I get a house? Although when you bought the house, you were like, oh, blessings. But as soon as something happens, oh my gosh, why did I buy that? I shouldn't have bought it. Lord, you shouldn't have given it to me. Or maybe you got in, get into a job, like as I said, you know, you're so happy. Yay, I have a job that's going to be, hopefully it's going to be stable. And then what, six months after, someone comes up to you and this is not going to be forever. Like, Why did you bring me here? I could just stay, I don't know, in my room forever. I don't have to be doing this. Many of the, uh, the, the auto, auto um, manufacturers in, in Michigan shutting down plants. Just a couple years ago, the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, a public employees union, says about 45,000 government layoffs have been go is going to be announced. All these things are happening, and yet the Lord continues to give to us. Manna came while it's still dark. The bread came to the Israelites, to the Hebrews, first thing in the morning at six. At, is first thing in the morning, six days a week, but not on the Sabbath. It was daily bread, not weekly bread. Some people come to church and say, gas me up, preacher, I've got a big week ahead. We need to gas up ourselves daily. What I'm saying is that the Lord's provision comes to us every day. We, it comes to us even when we're complaining. It comes to us even when we're rebellious. It comes to us when we think that the Lord doesn't know what he's doing. God could have rained down fire and brimstone, but instead he gave them manna to eat. But last but not the least, not only did the bread come from heaven, not only did the bread come at the right time, but last but not the least, the coming of the manna needs for you to do something about. From the people that was then, the Hebrews, and the people from us. What, what do I mean by that? When Jesus said, I am the bread of life, I am the one who came from heaven, and now it's here. What are you going to do about it? What must we do in response? If you see bread, what do you do? Do you keep it? Do you throw it away? Well, some of you might say, can I exchange it for rice? I don't know. But when we see the Lord, when we see the blessing from heaven, what do we do? We see bread, we eat it. We eat it. You know, the pleasures of this world are temporary and fading. We might think that the pleasure of the world is like going to be here forever. It's not going to be here forever. You know, we might look at this nice place we are in. We're not going to be here forever. We might look at the people around us. They're not going to be here forever. The pleasures of this world are temporary and fading. But only a relationship with Jesus can satisfy the hunger of the human heart and soul. That is what Jesus is saying. I'm the bread of life that came from heaven. If you come to me, you will never be thirsty and you will never be hungry. So what is he saying? Never be. He did not say, well, if you come to me, you'll be, you'll be okay for the first six hours. Then you might want some of me again. No, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger nor thirst. St. Augustine once prayed, thou hast made us for thyself and our hearts are restless without thee, meaning we cannot live without you. Only in Jesus do we find food for our souls, food so satisfying that as he says in verse 35, those who come to him, again, will never go hungry and never be thirsty and hopefully never complain. By the way, if you, you read that verse 35 again, guys, <laughs> now we have guys in the back, not girls anymore. So I better call them guys. Guys, first of all, thank you, uh, Joseph and Ken, for um, taking charge of our technical things. Thank you. They're giving me a thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but if you go back to verse 35, thank you. Food so satisfying that, as he says in verse 35, those who come to him will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be 
thirsty. By the way, if you, if you um, do a little bit of word study on that, the Greek here is very insistent. And so Jesus really is, this is what is Jesus is saying, whoever comes to me and no one else. He didn't just say, you come to me, because sometimes you might read that and say, whoever comes to me, or whoever comes to Buddha, okay too. Whoever comes to Muhammad, okay too. Whoever comes to whoever, okay too. No, he said, whoever comes to me and no one else will never be hungry or thirsty. What he's saying is this. He alone can satisfy our spiritual hunger. He alone is the bread of life. Now all we need to do is come and eat. I love it when people say, Kaina. You come into a house and go, kumain ka na? Don't ask me anymore kung kumain ka na. Just tell me, kain na. Kain na na. I remember one time somebody was looking for someone. Because of the way the Tagalog is with, with us Tagalog, and the Tagalog is, is going to be different in, in Visaya and going to be different for the Ilocanos. I'm talking about Tagalog, okay? Uh, uh, somebody said, nasaan si ano? And I'm sorry, Francisco, I'm talking in gibberish here. Nasaan si, let's go, Vaisa. Nasaan si Vaisa? If you ask a Tagalog person that, the, the, and she's eating at that time, I'm going to say, nakain. Which means what? She's eating. But when, when other people, I guess in other, um, uh, not languages, but in other um, dialects, uh, think of it, it's, it, it seems like what I'm saying is that someone ate her. That's why the person asked me, Nakain ng ano? Nakain dino? And I'm going, what? what are you talking about? Oh, okay. But anyway, I just I had to put that on the side. But that's what it is. It is the best thing that it will ever happen to me, at least, if I come into a house and somebody tells me, Pastor Jay, kain na. It's the best news I will have. That is exactly what Jesus is saying. I am the bread of life. Eat me up. Come to me. There is a feast that I'm setting before you, Jesus said, and only I can satisfy you. Notice the Israelites had to kind of bend down and receive the manna. It didn't come to a table. It did not grow on trees. They, you know, for, for, it, did, it didn't grow on trees for them to climb. Each had to take for themselves, which means what? You've got to do something. You're going to just sit there and go, oh, that's great. You're the bread of life. Oh, that's wonderful to know that you are the bread of life. He follows it up by saying, whoever comes to me, you have to take it for yourself. You have to say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want you to be my bread of life so that I will never hunger and I will never thirst. I have to do it. You have to do it. Isaiah said, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Seek him now while he's here. Too many Christians are still hungering for the usual diet of this world. We like stability in our lives. We like a great retirement. We like everything to fall into place. Let us, let us ask God to make us hungry for that spiritual bread that he's offering. Not just spoon-fed by the pastor or spoon-fed by your Sunday school teachers, but digging in it, in it for yourself. Every day, the children of Israel had two choices when they woke up. They could gather manna and eat it, or if not, they have to just walk away and find something else. Here is the bread of life in the midst of confusion, in the midst of uh, prayer requests that are not being answered, in the midst of anxiety, we also have two choices. We either gather the manna and take it and eat it, or we can choose to walk around it and wait for something else. We think, we think there's something else better there. Maybe we think there is something better on that other side. When Jesus revealed himself as the one and only bread of life that day, many of his followers left, by the way. You might say, oh, you know, you know, all the disciples ate the manna. All the disciples took Jesus in. Actually, if you look at verse 60, you have your Bibles with you, kind of move a little bit more. Still the same chapter. Ver, uh, chapter 6, verse 60. You got that, guys? There you go. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is hard teaching. 
Who can accept it? See that? On hearing that, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And they walked away. They didn't want to eat it. What about us? Can we accept hard teaching? Can we accept times when there's a hard times in our lives? Can we accept even though our answers are not being, our prayers are not being answered? Can we accept it even though we lose something? We lose our jobs, we lose our spouses, we lose our friends. Can we still accept it? That Jesus is the only way to satisfy our hunger for abundant life? Or will you turn and walk away because too hard, too hard teaching for me? You either eat it or you either walk away from it. You only have two choices. Let us stand and we're going to pray. Every head is bowed, every eye is closed.